We are so glad that you are here today. My name is Martin Andrews. I am the Communications Director at Inquire Ed. And I can see our participant list is growing. So I'm going to give just a few seconds for everyone to get connected. Thank you so much for being here for this last webinar in the Searching for Social Studies series. Today's webinar, Can Curriculum Transform Teaching? We've been waiting for this one. We're really excited about it. and We're so glad that you can join us. If you have questions anytime during any part of today's webinar, you can share them in the chat. And uh, I'm going to start out that I usually set it to panelists and attendees if I want to talk to everyone. And I'll just say hello right in there. Um, so thank you so much for coming. And you can use that chat to go ahead and ask questions during the webinar. We might get to them during the webinar. Uh, we might get to them after in the Q&A uh, session. And then we might reference some of them in the blog post that you receive on Friday. What blog post, you ask? Well, after we finish here today, uh, Friday morning, you'll receive an email from me with a link to a blog post. And that blog post is going to have in it a summary of the webinar. It is going to have a recording of the webinar. And importantly, it's going to have any resources that we mentioned during the course of the webinar. I know sometimes when, when a webinar panelist is talking and they're talking about all these great resources, you want to get them, we're going to uh, collate those and curate them for you and put them in the blog post, post so don't worry about that. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, as you're coming in. So great to have you. Um, and um, also that email that you receive will contain a link for a certificate of attendance, if that is something that you want to get. So for those of you just joining us, welcome. Chat your questions uh, as they come to you. Really quickly, I just want to find out a little bit more about you. Um, what's your role? Uh, are you a elementary teacher, a high school teacher, a district administrator? Are you in higher ed? Um, I'm going to launch a little poll here with the proviso, with the, with the acknowledgement that, listen, Zoom only gives me about 10 slots. So I know I, I won't have everyone's role. So if you're not on the list that I, uh, on the launch poll uh, list, then you could just chat that to us. What, what brings you here? And some of you have wear multiple hats. You can select multiple um, roles here. Are you an elementary teacher, middle school, high school, instructional coach, curriculum lead, district admin, principal? Are you from an ed organization? Are you a curriculum developer? Um, are you a professional learning provider? Here to find out about the connection between curriculum and professional learning. So uh, take that poll and let us know what your role is. And I will end the poll when 80% of us have voted. We're getting there, we're getting close. Um, tell us what your role is. And I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll and then share the results with you. It looks like we have curriculum leads uh, win the day, um, followed by instructional coaches. And then we have a, a great balance of middle school, high school uh, teachers, elementary teachers, whoever you are, whatever your role is, thank you so much for coming today. And I hope that you will find this webinar informative. I know just creating it and, and talking to our panelists over the last couple of days, um, I, it's, I'm so excited about the information that we have to share. This uh, webinar and the series is brought to you by, first, uh, the National Council for the Social Studies. The National Council for the Social Studies is such a great partner for this webinar series, and I wanted to sh share a little bit of upcoming events for NCSS. First of all, it's getting close to summertime, and that means that it's uh, institute and conference season in the summer. So they have the Summer Leadership Institute, July 12th and 13th. You can find out more about that at socialstudies.org slash professional learning. And then 
a collaboration with Inquire Ed, the Elementary Inquiry Institute. The Elementary Inquiry Institute is going to be an amazing two-day exploration of inquiry and social studies. And you can find out more about that at inquireed.org slash summer inquiry. We're super excited about that. That's virtual. So please sign up. Um, the webinar series is also brought to you by Inquire Ed. Inquire Ed has created Inquiry Journeys, our elementary social studies curriculum to move students and teachers beyond the textbook, supporting culturally responsive teaching and inquiry-based teaching and learning, um, aligned to standards and with high quality diverse sources and linked to high quality professional learning as well. I also wanna announce that We've got a new webinar series that is coming in the fall, and that is Inquiry in Social Studies from Standards to Practice. So often we see inquiry-based social studies referred to in our standards, but what we hear from our partners, what we hear from our audience members like you, what does it actually look like? So we want to break down what inquiry looks like in practice. So some of the webinars under consideration, five keys to elementary social studies and ELA integration, culturally responsive strategies in social studies, and avoiding pitfalls and your social studies curriculum rollout. So we've got a great lineup coming for the fall. You can always find out more about that on inquired.org. Please check it out. So today, we're talking specifically about curriculum and professional learning. And I wanna stop my share here. And before I bring our guest on, one of the things that Inquire Ed at our, at our founding, um, we knew that curriculum and professional learning couldn't be separated. Uh, our founder, Shanti, who's gonna be on a little bit later, was going around to talk to people about the model we are developing and she would, she would do this gesture, that curriculum and professional learning had to be integrated. But as we talked to people, what we found is they saw those two things as separate. They were different budgets. They were different departments in a district. So it was difficult to begin that conversation, but we knew that as teachers, all of us being former teachers, we knew that was the right thing, that we had had to build our own curriculum. And then we had to participate in professional learning that often was a, a drive-by workshop that didn't feel like it related to what happened in the day-to-day -day work in the classroom. So we started to create a high-quality instructional material, and we put our heads down, and we created inquiry journeys, and we began to think about what the professional learning model that could go with that is. And we've been working hard. And when we had time to look up, what we found was a moment of synchronicity, because we found out that the amazing people at the Carnegie Corporation were investigating, exploring, researching, and explaining in such a articulate and straightforward way the power of this model. And that's why we're so glad today to be joined by Jim Short. He is the pro Program Director for Leadership and Teaching to Advanced Learning at the Carnegie Corporation, New York. His work at the foundation focuses on building the capacity of teachers principals, and system leaders to implement new college and career ready standards in English language arts and literacy, mathematics, and science. So Jim is going to give that experience. And then we're going to have Shanti on a little bit later to connect it to the social studies. So I'm so glad to be joined by Jim Short. Jim, if you can um, turn on your video here. Uh, and it's so great to have you here. We're really yeah. excited, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Martin, for that wonderful introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. So Great, and I will disappear right now into the chat and, uh, and I will share anything in there that, uh, that you might mention. Great. All right, so the slides look good? Yeah, so slides look great. All right, that's wonderful. Well, again, thank you for joining us today. And I hope that you find this useful and, and, uh, and very excited to share the work that we've been doing at the corporation in this area. So I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of a growing base of research that shows that using better instructional materials can improve student outcomes equal to that of having a better teacher in front of the classroom. And so we'll be looking at uh, some of that evidence and some of those studies uh, in a few minutes. Um, one of the things that grounds this work is thinking about a, a theory of action. How do we change um, and improve? How do we change teaching, improve student learning at scale? Uh, and so Rick, Richard Elmore has this uh, model of the instructional core that we use a lot to kind of think about how do we uh, improve student learning at scale. And that's sort of the, 
the part of the seat of the stool. And so the three legs of the stool become sort of the focus. And if we change any one leg, obviously the stool is not in balance. And so to continue to improve student learning at scale, we have to pay attention to all three legs or in a sense, all three levers of curriculum reform. And so the, the blue language there are Elmore's terms. And then I've interpreted a little bit to, to then how we think of, of uh, the, how these three levers play out. So the first one to look at is changing the level of content. And we do this when we change standards um, or when we change assessments. And so that changes then what kids are, are supposed to be able to know and be able to do. But once we change that, the other two levers or uh, legs of the stool become uh, in balance. And so we have to look at those as well. And so one of the uh, er other areas is improving or increasing the knowledge and skills teachers have and professional learning is a strategy to obviously do that. And then the third lever is the level of student engagement in learning and in, in high quality instructional materials are one of the ways to do that. And we think a really powerful way to do that. And so this is sort of the, the theory of action of like what undergirds a lot of the work that we do in the portfolio that I lead at the foundation. I also want to define a few terms. Um, when I use instructional materials and curriculum materials, they're sort of interchangeable. And we're talking about the actual materials that teachers use and put in front of students to guide instruction. High quality instructional materials have two parts. They have student facing part and a teacher facing part. And so the student facing part would again be the materials, the tasks, the problem, the text, um, what, what, is, what are the, the resources and materials that you're putting in front of students to engage them in learning? But high quality instructional materials also include a tremendous amount of support for the teacher. So instead of just what to teach, there's a lot of support there for how to teach it. And many times the teacher facing materials are two or three times uh, as dense as what the student unit uh, materials may look like. And so it gets all the way down to the lesson level of providing uh, support and strategies and, and ways of actually uh, implementing the lessons that are included. And then there's a third term that's used in the literature called educative curriculum materials. And these are when you look more closely at, well, what makes materials not just educative for students, obviously, but how could they also be educative for teachers? And so in those teacher facing materials, what are the components that actually help support teacher learning? Because even the best professional learning is only gonna be a certain amount of time that teachers have uh, in those settings. A lot of work teachers still do on their own, planning at home, working with other teachers. And so how could the materials actually help support and provide teachers with like, um, examples of, of typical student responses or additional support for uh, facilitating a lesson, but but not scripting the lesson. We're not we're not talking about scripted curriculum. Um, I, I know many traditional textbooks have a teacher's edition that's more of a wraparound kind of um, format, and, and we're not talking about that either. We're talking about something much more extensive than that. So if you're interested in that, you should you should look it up online because there's some really good uh, research articles that define what educative curriculum materials look like, particularly in science, uh, which is where the research that I'm most familiar with. I want to take a minute and just look at some of the studies that have been done to help make the case for why curriculum matters. And the first one there on the left, uh, the, the snapshot is sort of saying, when we look at effect size, um, changing the curriculum or the materials, the lessons that teachers are working with actually has a larger effect size than when we change the quality of the teacher. Um, and so that was one in indication to sort of get our attention. In the middle there, um, we're looking at how uh, a lower performing teacher and a high performing teacher both have access to high quality, well-designed lessons. And it turns out the lower performing teacher benefits even more because there they're provides more support, more structure for that teacher uh, to then improve student learning. And so that's an important uh, aspect of why curriculum matters. And then the third one there is looking at both a model where Curriculum, high quality instructional materials and curriculum based professional learning were combined in a treatment. And when that was put together, students gained four months of instruction. But they looked at the data a little more and were able in their modeling to tease out and say, well, part of that increase in student learning was because teachers got better at teaching. But another part 
of that improvement of student learning was because of the curriculum that teachers were using. And so again, makes a really strong case for combining high quality curriculum with curriculum-based professional learning to improve teacher practice. And then finally, um, when we look at the positive effects for students uh, that are amplified when strong curriculum is paired with strong professional learning, not only are students working with more rigorous instruction materials, but they also have a more skillful teacher to guide them. And so one study found that when teachers participated in curriculum-based professional learning, their students' test scores improved by 9% of a standard deviation, about the same effect caused by replacing an average teacher with a top performing teacher or reducing the class size by 15%. So when students' teachers use new curriculum that did not receive professional learning support, that impact was only about a 6% of standard deviation. So we, it does help make the case for the importance of curriculum-based professional learning. So the implications are clear. Curriculum matters, but how teachers use curriculum matters even more. And so this leads us to the report that we put out, uh, which we, uh, I co-authored with Stephanie Hurst, the former executive director of Learning Forward, who's now retired, uh, worked with me over the last couple of years uh, putting this together. And the goal of a challenge paper from a Carnegie Corporation is to lift up ideas and issues in a way that will influence the field and our nation's agenda in education. The subjects and questions that we explore and the issues we frame grow out of our grant making work. This challenge paper explores how professional learning anchored in high quality curriculum materials can allow teachers to experience instruction as their students will, change instructional practices and lead to better student outcomes. So what did we do and how did we come up with the elements? Well, in the fall of 2019, pre-pandemic times when you could actually get together, uh, Carnegie Corporation convened a group of grantees in the education programs, leadership and teaching portfolio that I lead that's, that was made up of leading curriculum developers, organizations that support teaching and learning and some of their school and district partners, which you can see uh, listed here on the slide. Over, over two days and later in more than two dozen follow-up interviews, we asked questions, we listened closely and we learned a lot. We learned about the specific challenges schools and systems face. What logistical hurdles were the toughest to overcome? What worked and what tactics helped reset expectations for what students and teachers could do? How did support from outsiders help build a stable base for change? And what learning experiences did teachers value most? And we also then conducted an in-depth analysis of the research literature and what evidence was there and what that had to say about the success as well as the challenges these systems were facing. So the elements were identified to inform the design and implementation of curriculum-based professional learning. We think teachers deserve the highest quality professional learning to support the implementation of new instructional materials and curriculum. In the report, we identify a core set of actions and approaches and enabling conditions that effective schools and systems had in place to reinforce and amplify the power of high quality curriculum and skillful teaching. The elements of curriculum-based professional learning or simply the elements provide essential guidance for transforming teaching and student learning. So we offer these as the elements and essentials of curriculum-based professional learning. You might even also notice the shape of the diagram. It's similar to a periodic table of elements you may remember from science class. And it's no surprise, I was actually a former science teacher for the first 10 years of my career in education. And just as chemical elements are what all physical matter is made up of, we think these elements are what is needed to design and implement well curriculum-based professional learning. Taken together in different combinations, the elements of curriculum-based professional learning can lead to improved learning opportunities for teachers, as well as better outcomes for students. So it's a simple concept, right? Well, sort of. Making professional learning work for teachers is a simple concept, but one that is very challenging to execute well. Teachers must experience the same kind of inquiry-based learning we expect them to provide their students. Whether it's ELA, math or science, or even social studies, students take ownership of their learning by solving problems, making meaning from text and investigating phenomena. 
Teachers deserve the same opportunities to learn new ways of teaching that support that type of learning. So we're gonna take a minute, couple of minutes here and listen to Rosalind, who is a science teacher, middle school science teacher in Boston Public Schools. It's, it's, she's taught for almost about nine years and she works in a dual language school. So all of her instruction is in Spanish as well as English. This is her second year using Open Syed instructional materials, which is some new instructional materials that, the, that we've helped support the development of to align with the next generation science standards. She talks about what the shifts were for her in learning to use this new curriculum. So let's take a few minutes and listen to Rosalind. Well, it definitely does feel like um, a shift from being a like, purveyor of knowledge, like I'm giving instruction, to being, you know, on the same level as my students. And Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, was the volume okay? I forgot to check if I was sharing sound. It was a little low, Jim. Um, okay, let me, like, let me, I think what I did is I um, did in not. In that box, you always have to remember to. Yeah, check. I know. I was going to forget it very, often. So. so let me. Um, and discovering something. Let me share the screen again to make sure. All right, it says sharing sound. So hopefully we're good this time. Well, it definitely does feel like um, a shift from being a like purveyor of knowledge, like I'm giving instruction to being, you know, on the same level as my students and discovering something together. Um, and for some units, it definitely feels like a play I'm putting on because, you know, I know the answers to certain things. But for example, I've never taught sound before. Um, and I actually no longer really feel as stressed out, like cramming the subject matter in before I start delivering it. Um, because it really does lends, lend itself to just exploring something together. You know, I, of course, do my prep with the, um, the teacher material, so I, I do know where we're going, but um, I don't have that anxiety of like, oh my gosh, what if they ask a question I don't know the answer to? It's just like, well, I don't know, let's write it down and see if we, you know, come up with something that helps to answer it to make. Um, and be comfortable, become comfortable with, of like not knowing the answers and that being okay. And like really relying heavily on student input. Like they are the ones driving the car. Um, and that can seem a little scary at first, but I think that's actually something that I really appreciated from participating in the PD that we were provided is um, practicing that and it, at times feels slightly corny of like being asked to pretend you're a seventh grader, but I think it's really necessary so that you're comfortable with the awkward silences that could happen in your classroom. Because um, I think for some teachers, you know, myself included, sometimes we get a little nervous when we don't hear something right away. Um, and I think that with Open Syed, it's just part of it. You know, it's just like that thinking time, you know, trusting what your students are saying and asking, it comes together. And I think um, that was maybe the biggest shift for me. Um, the other shift is actually, it, I, it was a welcome shift because at times with um, the other curriculum that I was following, it felt a little choppy and, um, I always knew like it has, I, I always wanted it to flow better so that it made more sense. And, you know, kids want to know why we're learning what we're learning. I think any teacher will tell you that, like they have to have the why, but um, I, I didn't always have it like to give them. And with Open Syed, it's, it's just woven so beautifully throughout that I don't, it's that's the whole storyline teaching like there's a reason that that's the foundation of this model right is just 
it has to make sense and it has to tie together so that it's like connected to other things. Um, so that was uh, an easier shift to make for me because it was a, a wanted shift. All right, so let's take a minute and dive in to what the elements look like to better understand this experience that Rosalind had with curriculum-based professional learning. The first uh, category that we're gonna look at are what are called the core design features. And these are the features that identify the purpose of curriculum-based professional learning. And they include curriculum, obviously, transformative learning and equity. So the first one is about curriculum. Developing fluency in a curriculum does not mean simply following it to the letter. Teachers should still adjust their instruction to meet student needs. Curriculum materials and support can help teachers become comfortable with learning activities that uh, keep students on track and meet ambitious goals. Educative instructional materials help teachers anticipate likely challenges, offer context and suggestions, and prompt teachers to rehearse instruction with a wide range of student questions in mind. Um, it's, a, it's about talking points, not a script. Um, and, and part of what I think educative materials do really well is when they don't just provide the, 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 the content, the disciplinary content and the, and the pedagogical strategies for you know, how to engage kids, but the pedagogical content knowledge of how to teach specific content. Um, I was a biology teacher for the first 10 years of my career. And if you asked me how I learned to teach biology, I, I learned the content. I had an undergraduate degree in biology, um, master's in education. But if you asked me about teaching specific topics and units in biology, it was because I was working with what at the time was a high quality inquiry based biology curriculum. And so it helped me learn how to engage kids in some of the misconceptions and some of the uh, guide them through a series of activities to help them really construct deep understandings of, of biology. The second uh, core design feature here is about transformative learning. So we're talking about experiences, not speeches. Uh, districts spend a lot of money on motivational speakers or, um, or one-time seminars in professional learning. But if we're really going to change teachers' practices and deeply held beliefs, we need to really have a different way of thinking about professional learning. And, and transformative professional learning uh, is, is that thing. Um, and so it requires a different design. It's going to be connected to some of the other elements that we'll look at here in a minute. And then the third core design feature is equity. Every student should have access to high quality demanding curriculum and opportunities to think critically. Every teacher should know how to scaffold learning experiences so that students are supported to engage with complex materials and activities. Promoting equity means avoiding strategies that leave underrepresented students out of standards aligned learning based on their current skill level. If a discussion centers on a high, highly complex text, for example, a teacher can read the text to less prepared students and engage their thinking at a complex level, even if the prerequisite skills are not fully established by those students. When teachers develop deep expertise in content, curriculum, and instructional strategies, they can apply relevant tools and support to ensure underrepresented students complete challenging work. In other words, scaffold, don't simplify. And that's a huge part of what I think well-designed curriculum materials bring to the equity conversation. The next set of elements are the structural elements. And these are the ones that describe the parameters or the settings for curriculum-based professional learning. And they include collective participation, models, and time. So what do we mean by collective participation? It means we think about how we group teachers, either if they are in the same school, in the same grade, in the same department, they teach the same courses, they work with uh, students teaching the same subject. So it means they also use the same instructional materials. And so how we organize teachers in professional learning so that they can learn together working with the same curriculum materials uh, is, can be very powerful. And so that's one of the structures. Another one is about models. Um, summer institutes are the beginning, but they're not the end. Curriculum-based professional learning continues throughout the school year and takes on different forms, including professional learning communities, instructional coaching. Um, it, it needs to be ongoing and sustainable, which means it cannot be led solely by outside experts. Schools and districts must plan for the future by building in-house expertise and leadership pipelines 
to facilitate curriculum-based professional learning. And then the final, the third structure here is time. Um, many times, uh, often we think of time as a resource, which it is, but it's also about how we structure people's time. Um, and in this case, it's um, thinking about not just that we put teachers in PLCs, but how are they using that time in the PLC? Is it, is it focused around sort of supporting, working on um, the curriculum? Um, time is also a, a precious uh, resource, and so it has to be also thought about um, are we using it in the most effective way uh, to bring teachers together, uh, not just during the summer, but in common planning time and in other uh, grade level meetings. Uh, can that time be used to then focus on the curriculum and the instructional materials that teachers are teaching with? I think many times we start with these structural design features when we think about uh, professional learning, and we don't look as much at this next set of elements, which we call the functional design elements. And these are what inform how curriculum-based professional learning works when designed and implemented. Um, in some ways, it's, and it's the pedagogy of how, one, how do you do curriculum-based professional learning. And there, there are four elements here, learning designs, beliefs, reflection and feedback, and change management. Before we go into looking at those uh, four elements, I wanna take a, <coughs> a minute and um, have you think about this question about the research about teacher change. What does research tell us about how teachers change? So there, there are three main goals <laughs> to professional learning programs. Change in, change in the classroom practice of teachers, change in the attitudes and beliefs of teachers and change in the learning outcomes for students. So what do we think is the right sequence of how those outcomes are most frequently occur? In other words, in order to facilitate teacher change, what's the most effective sequence? And so I want you to take a minute and look at these four and, um, and, and to yourself kind of commit to one that you think makes the most sense. And so you know, do you start with teacher beliefs and then move on? Or do you start with changes in practice and move on? And so take a minute and think about which, which of those do you think is what the research uh, supports? <clears throat> Hopefully you've got one in mind. And th the research that I'm referring to is an article that uh, Tom Gusky wrote uh, several years ago and, makes, uh, and uses that research to talk about, well, first what we need to do is provide professional learning and engage teachers in some new ways of teaching and get them comfortable enough to be willing to go back and try those practices in the classroom. And so that's what comes first. And then when they see how students are gonna re respond to that approach to teaching, how does it engage them in learning? How does it uh, capture their curiosity? How does it uh, surface um, the ideas that they have and then start moving them toward working on those ideas and, and, and adding new ideas to, to that. Uh, that comes next. And when teachers see that that's positive and that this actually is, is working with students, then over time, they start to shift their beliefs. And so I think it's important for us to remember as much as we want teachers to shift their beliefs and think about these new ways of teaching, um, that doesn't, that's not where we start. We have to start with uh, giving them the ability to start with some, some new teaching practices and to see how then that uh, affects students. So again, I wanna listen a little bit to a, a person who's done a lot of work in thinking about this kind of professional learning. Uh, Kate McNeil is a professor of science education at Boston College, and she's the primary lead on the design of Open Syed's professional learning approach. And so she's gonna talk a little bit about how that approach is a little different than traditional professional development uh, that focuses on training teachers to use new curriculum. What, what, is, what is the kind that we're, uh, approach that we're talking about look like? So let's, let's listen a couple of minutes to Kate. One of the things, again, that's different about these units is kids start off by experiencing an anchoring phenomena. So um, in thermal energy, they do an investigation looking at cups. In the sound unit, they watch a video um, where someone's blasting a car speaker and you see a window shaking in a building. So the units always start off with this anchoring phenomena where kids are coming up with questions and then it kind of unfolds over the story of the unit. I think it's really important for teachers to try to put themselves in that place, to try to think about where are kids gonna come from, what ideas might they draw from, what questions might they have, what might they be uncomfortable about. Um, 
in order to help them better anticipate the needs and draw out kids' ideas when they're actually in the classroom. I think it can be easy to jump ahead, um, especially because like as science teachers and adults, um, they might know the right answer. Um, but here we want all of these ideas and questions to be really coming from the kids. So engaging in that kind of student hat encourages teachers to take a step back and think, don't think like an adult teacher, try to think like one of your kids, put yourself in the mindset of one of your kids and how, they, how might they experience this lesson? Where might they want to go? And doing that can help them, the teachers think differently about the unit and better support their kids when it comes to actually enacting it in their classrooms. So we're gonna dive a little deeper into what Kate's talking about as we look across these next uh, four functional design elements. The first one here is about learning designs. And this requires shifting teachers' perspectives. Rather than tell teachers about a curriculum, let them experience it for themselves. Uh, Kate talked about student hat. And so many times uh, we ask teachers to put off, take off their teacher hat and put on a student hat and actually experience the curriculum as a learner and engage in it the way their students would. And as Kate pointed out, it gives teachers insights into how their students are going to experience the curriculum. I think it also gives teachers a chance to deepen their content knowledge. So sometimes a curriculum may be posing a question or engaging them in a task that is not familiar to teachers. And so by being a learner, they can sort of experience it in a safe environment and, and, and learn uh, from it just as their students would, but also prepares them better to be that then leader of instruction when they do it with students. So it's a little bit like a mirror image. We want teachers to have the same experience their students are gonna have. The second uh, element here in this area is about beliefs. And so sometimes I think we need to rock the boat a bit and kind of kickstart some new ideas putting some evidence of what works on the table and asking teachers to think about it. And so a disruptive experience, such as putting on a student hat during a lesson and experiencing it might um, give, not only give you an authentic view of what the teaching looks like, but it could start to launch a conversation, uh, getting teachers to surface some of their assumptions about curriculum, about instruction, about learning um, and getting at, getting at their, their beliefs. Reflection and feedback is the next one. Uh, and this is uh, asking teachers, uh, in years past, teachers were left to kind of on their own to sort of uh, for, figure out, uh, figure things out on their own. And then were, most of the feedback that they got was during performance evaluations. So in curriculum-based professional learning, it's less hierarchical, hierarchical and more constructive. Um, at each stage of the learning cycle, teachers reflect individually and jointly on their instruction on the curriculum and in facilitated conversations, as well as uh, sometimes being given writing prompts. And so um, this is also where um, you might look at student data to see how kids are doing and then connect that to the curriculum uh, work as well. And, and so again, facilitated time, not just on your own, but, but in groups with others. And then finally, the last element in this group is on change management. Um, it's important to remember, and we know this from research, that change is a process. It's not an event. Change isn't the difference between before and after. Rather, it's an ongoing disruption of thinking and doing. It requires adults to make and remake their knowledge, actions, and beliefs, which requires attention and energy over time. Important change happens over three to five years, not during a single launch period. And so we need to look at and continue to monitor what teachers' concerns are, what their attitudes are, what their understanding of the curriculum is, what their ability to use the materials and use that information to inform uh, future professional learning as we go along. And then the, finally, we have what are called the essentials, which are the necessary conditions at the system level for curriculum-based professional learning. And these include leadership, resources, and coherence. Um, basically for leadership, we're actually trying to put leadership and learning together in the same boat. So instead of just thinking of leadership as some, as folks, as leaders that have all the answers, instead we wanna think of it about learning alongside colleagues and teachers, that leaders and teachers learn together and, and that they model that kind of risk taking and, and do a good job of listening and asking questions and reflecting with their colleagues. And so that's the view of leadership that we think provides the enabling condition here. 
Um, resources we talked about before, um, not only is time important, but you know, money is important, people, uh, human capital is important. And so how these things come together and are needed to support a curriculum, uh, this was probably pretty obvious. Uh, but we wanted to make sure it wasn't forgotten. And then the last one is coherence. Uh, and this is trying to thread together different initiatives and work that district is doing. You know, um, the favorite saying of veteran teachers is don't worry, this too shall pass uh, because the initiatives keep coming and coming and more come. And so what if things could be threaded together? And so a focus on the curriculum means that it could be connected to the policies around homework, the use of assessments, whether they're interim assessments or formative assessment, uh, how you're engaging families and parents in, in their students' learning. Um, all these things could be connected around the implementation of, of high quality curriculum and, and make the work that teachers are doing, but also the work the system is doing more coherent. So when you visit um, our website at the corporation, at the foundation, um, at carnegie.org forward slash elements, in addition to being able to download the full report, uh, we've taken several of the pieces of the report and made them separate uh, handouts so you can get a, a, a page of just showing the elements. Uh, there's a set of recommendations of, for what we think people could do to move some of this into practice. Um, there's also some stories about what this work looks like in the field that we uh, curated from the work of our grantees and districts that you may find helpful. Uh, one of the resources in the report is this chart talking about um, six fundamental shifts that we need to make uh, and that the elements provide some information to help guide that journey. Uh, and, and so what we're trying to do here is contrast traditional professional development, which many times in curriculum is more what I would call training sessions, to what we think curriculum-based professional learning looks like that's more supportive of treating uh, teachers like learners and modeling the same kind of learning that their kids uh, experience. And so this could be a way to start a conversation by just examining these shifts and thinking about what, what are your current practices and experiences uh, in professional learning around curriculum. And then these are the recommendations that I was referring to. They're done by roles. So there's a set for teachers. Uh, school leaders, as well as, as, as coaches and professional learning providers. And they're uh, organized around these different categories of the elements, giving specific actions of what you could do in the design features and enabling conditions to support curriculum-based professional learning. So these are in, in the report, but they're also downloadable, uh, great things to then start a conversation with about some of these ideas. So the elements in the essentials represent what we know and what we care about in high quality professional learning to support curriculum implementation. It's what compels me and I hope it compels you as well. But this is not easy to do. It requires the ability to integrate the elements in ways that go beyond what most schools and systems are currently doing to support teachers using new curriculum. Taken together, the elements and essentials offer a foundation for practitioners looking to undertake this work. They also serve as a call to action. By reshaping current practices with the elements and essentials as a guide, we can help teachers develop the skills, knowledge, and understanding they need to set all students up for success. So I wanna thank you for listening and hope that it was uh, helpful. And I'm gonna now I think be joined by Shanti and we're gonna talk a little bit about, yeah, learn about I think how this connects to social studies. Absolutely, and, um, and I'll bring Shanti on. And, um, and then uh, what I'd like to do is take a look and, and maybe the three of us can take a look. And Jim, as we begin to talk through the model, first of all, of, um, of curriculum-based professional learning and the social studies, I think one question that I would have as a, as a bridge is um, what, what is that first step that a school or district might take when they're looking at, in, at creating a, a curriculum-based professional learning model in their, in their school or district? Well, I think the first step is obvious, is, it goes back to those core elements. And the first one is reflecting on, well, are we using high quality instruction materials? Do we have a high quality curriculum? We know from research and studies that other people have done like Rand and Ed reports, that um, when people that have looked at curriculum um, and looked at how uh, it compares to the standards, only about 30% of the schools in the country have selected a, a high quality curriculum. So I think that's the place to start. 
But then how are we supporting teachers in using new instructional materials and curriculum? And like I said before, I think a lot of times we put professional learning around curriculum in the training category. So if, if you train me on things about how to use this phone, um, that's great. But when the phone doesn't work, then I don't know how to fix it because you just train me on like some of the apps and so forth. So I think teachers need a deeper understanding of, of high quality curriculum so that they can make adjustments to it to make it fit the needs and, of their students, but do it with some integrity of what the designer of the curriculum had in mind. And so you don't turn it into something else. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so what I think we'll do now, Jim, is just go through and talk a little bit about our model. I'm going to ask Shanti some questions. We're going to go through some uh, slides. And then maybe what we can do is bring bring you back at the end and have everyone ask both of you questions about this. So um, so Shanti, what is the curriculum? Why curriculum based professional learning in elementary social studies specifically? Like Jim was talking about it in math and in, and in science and in literacy. But why does it matter so much in elementary social studies? And you're muted, Shanti, so. Sorry about that. Well, you know, I, I might take the word elementary out and just say okay. social studies in general and really think about where we've been in social studies over the last few years, um, starting with the C3 framework, now with the roadmap, seeing standards be shifting. And actually what we see is actually a lot of consensus in social studies, despite what you see out there about every news article saying that there is no consensus in social studies and there's lots of debate about a lot of things. Actually, inquiry is a consensus, right? We see that districts across the nation are really saying, we want to move to an inquiry-based model, that inquiry is the way we should be teaching social studies. And so that shift in, in moving from a more traditional model to an inquiry-based approach really means that we've really got to think about how do we shift teacher practice? And so really from the beginning at Inquired, we've really been thinking about what does that look like? And I love Jim's slide about thinking about how do we shift practice and really being research-based. And what that sh slide shows us is that actually teachers are research-based, that you can't just say to them, yeah, this is what how students are going to learn. They're actually really concerned with how students learn. And, but that means diving in and really understanding the work. And we can't just do that with professional learning. If we just come in with a one or two day professional development, then what we're doing is we're not providing the way for them to actually go do it. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, if we're just providing the curriculum, we're really just saying, you know, go, go forth, see what happens. And we're really not providing that support that really it intentionally needs to be there as we think about moving to an inquiry based model. Yeah. And I would, if we did put, uh, elementary back in there for a second, I would say that um, from, from my perspective as a social studies teacher, when I was teaching, I, I know that elementary teachers weren't teaching social studies. Very true. They weren't given the time to teach it. They weren't given the resources to teach it. So now that it's become a priority, as we're seeing it's become, it's, it's, it's a first time for me. Definitely. Um, so I want to take a look at our model that, that we use. We use these gears to talk about the way that high quality instructional materials interact with implementation coaching and learning communities and instructional and school leaders. Um, and specifically, I want to start with this, uh, what Jim said is the most important thing and what we really had spent the last few years developing is the high quality instructional material that is inquiry journeys. Can you talk me through, Shanti, the what makes a, um, a high quality instructional material in the social studies? We have these domains. Talk a little bit about them for me. Yeah, uh, I'll be pretty quick here in just saying that because we, we have a lot of other webinars that folks are interested in really just that dive deep into the high quality instructional materials part of this. But what we realized is, is what Jim did a really nice job of is saying, what are high quality instructional materials across subject areas? So what does it look like? And what I, I really loved about what Jim did is he differentiated between just a, a curriculum, a student facing resource, kind of an old textbook model of here's the workbook, here's the textbook, to really thinking about the robustness that needs to be there in instructional material, in high quality instructional materials. And honestly, we haven't seen that in social studies. Social studies, is the model of curriculum has stayed pretty stagnant while other subject areas, ELA, science, social, uh, math, have really moved a little bit more to the high quality space. But we also needed to define what this looked like for social studies. And so we at Inquire Ed really defined five domains for us to be our guiding light as we decided, uh, designed our curriculum materials, our high quality instructional materials. And really inquiry was at the heart of the work that we've been doing 
really thinking about how we support culture responsive education. I believe very strongly that that piece needs to be across subject areas, but especially when we're talking about social studies, when we're talking about you know tricky, challenging topics, hard history, sometimes the terms used, when we're thinking about the lived and historical experience of our students, really comes to the heart of, at the social in, a, in social studies. Thinking about standards based instruction and assessment, Thinking about sources in a different way, this is again, something that's very different for social studies. I would say that most other curriculums or most other subject areas might not mention high quality diverse sources. But as we thought about what makes a social studies curriculum high quality and instructional material that teachers can really go use without having to vet their own sources, without having to rely on only one secondary, one source, a textbook, we really felt it was important to put it at the forefront. And then really thinking about the curriculum-based professional learning model, and that provides instructional uh, supports and continuous professional learning. And so I think that last piece will really be the piece that we can go into in those other years. Yeah, and I think I just shared that if someone wants to look at it, many of our, our viewers are gonna be familiar with this document already, but there is a, a, a review guide that we put out um, that, that breaks down what those domains are. What, how would we define those domains? What would be the indicators of those domains? Um, so, okay, great, Shanti. We designed like the, the high quality instructional material that is Inquiry Journeys. We're done, right? Like that's, but what we just heard from Jim and, and what you uh, just mentioned there in that last domain is that there's another cog that we are specifically looking at it. There was a great, uh, in a conversation with Jim, he referred to onboarding, that that's training is an, is an event and that implementation is a process. And I love that. And I think we, we then used that the next day when we were talking to a partner. Um, and so what we're what we've trying what we're trying to do here it, with what who we what we call the inquiry advocate and i ask you to explain the inquiry advocate model here in a second is build that capacity at the school district because we could do webinar after webinar video recording training all of those things that might help but building that capacity at the school site is really important tell me about how what an inquiry advocate is and how they do that yeah so in our inquiry advocate model, we really think about really a train the trainer model. So who are those instructional leaders at the district, at the school that we can really work with that are our touch points that become our flag bearers? I'll step back for a second and say, when we were thinking about designing this model, we were thinking a lot about, okay, should we, as, as Martin said, should we the, be the ones who are the touch points for the teachers? So with that, but that would bring some really inherent challenges because we aren't there every day, right? These instructional leaders are there and we really wanted to build this capacity at the district level. But we also realized that we needed to provide some expertise. You know, if you read some of the other read, uh, the writings about models that are similar to a curriculum-based professional learning model, sometimes there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, ownership put on the district to design this, to design the professional learning along the curriculum they've adopted. And we realized we're the experts on our curriculum, on our instructional materials. So we need to provide that expertise on the model, on inquiry, and but have these instructional leaders kind of to get the best of both worlds so that capacity is built in that district, within that school, so teachers have those ongoing touch points. So usually it's a district deciding, a district administrator deciding who they are, and sometimes it's teacher leaders, instructional coaches, assistant principals can really vary based off of the model that that make work sense, makes the most sense for that district. In terms of what they do, we provide a lot of onboarding supports as well as ongoing professional learning support. So it's really kind of a mirror within a mirror. What do we want them to be doing for teachers? And then what do we want to be doing for them? So it starts with, you know, an onboarding of what is a, an inquiry advocate, what really getting them on board with that, then providing them with both the professional learning and the materials, again, a curriculum based professional learning model, giving them actually the materials to facilitate onboardings for teachers while providing them with coaching around that. Then as teachers are getting going and really diving into the work. Our partner experience team is really working to implement and support that implementation. So we've got coaches on calls with those instructional leaders, the inquiry advocates every month, really talking through the ch challenges, going through a scope and sequence to talk about assessment, to talk about culturally relevant practice, to talk about all of the things that we really want them digging into with teachers. Um, they're the ones often engaging with the larger inquiry ed community and kind of talking about what's working in your district, what's not working, well, how are you troubleshooting here, really thinking about drawing those dots. And so it's a really integral part of our program. And 
And so yeah, I just had a look at, so what our partner, we have a partner experience team and they're going to be in a specific district. They're going to be meeting once a month with those inquiry advocates, whether they're teacher leaders, instructional coaches, assistant principals. And I had a look at the syllabus today that they're going to go through. And it is like a it's like a graduate class in inquiry. Um, it is going through assessment, but it's all linked to the curriculum that teachers are using. And what's wonderful about it is that it, it gets to some of the things that Jim was talking about because they're in those classes, in those meetings, they're using the same kind of protocols. They're using the same strategies that are used within the curriculum. Yeah, and I'm oh, sorry, Martin, go ahead. Well, I have a question for you about this, this model too, because it, it is not, um, at, at the beginning, I think we thought about them as two separate things. You, you, would, you would buy this curriculum, right? And then you would add on this professional learning. And that changed in your thinking. Uh, talk about that change. Yeah, I, you know, I would say that we always wanted our district partners to be doing both, but we, so it's actually a little bit different is, um, most of the um, partners that uh, that um, curriculum providers that um, Jim mentioned earlier, a lot of times they're actually doing open source resources, and then they're charging for the professional learning that goes with that to keep their organization sustainable. We uh, kind of were trying trying to figure out what does this look like for us, and what we found is is we when we were charging for the professional learning, a lot of districts didn't have the set up the budget decision, Jim touched on this earlier, for curriculum and professional learning were happening from different places. And sometimes there was this disconnect and we had saw a lot of people saying like, oh, I'll just do the curriculum. And we felt that the inquiry advocate model, this professional learning model, the ongoing professional learning was so important to, and integral to making a shift to inquiry. We just said, forget it, we're not charging for it. We're just gonna include it in our model because we don't want it to be a barrier to doing this work. That we don't want people just saying, just go and try this out. It's really challenging work and it puts teachers in a really challenging situation to make and shift in practice if they're not getting that professional learning as well. And so that we really shifted our model to just include it in our, in our curricular model so that to make sure that all of our district partners and school partners have the opportunity to participate in this. I, I wanna, um go through these really quickly because I want to bring Jim back on. Uh, we, we love this. Uh, when, you could have a high quality, high quality instructional material, but if you introduce it, often like uh, teachers move to the panic zone. This is brand new stuff. I don't know how to use it. Um, and without the introduction of that, they stay in a comfort zone with maybe the, what, they, what they're used to. We really want them in that stretch zone uh, and that, that learning and growth zone. And that's what the inquiry advocate really does. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this here, but I want to just say another important cog is the instructional school leaders. And we're learning more about that. We, we learned that, hey, listen, a building principal can really be a make or break uh, actor in this, whether a curriculum works or not, and whether the curriculum-based professional learning model works. So we've been designing uh, sessions and interactions and um, and and different professional learning opportunities for those district or for those school leaders at the building level. Um, I want to bring Jim back on. Hey, Jim, if you can come back on because I want to. Uh, uh, first of all, um, you know, we had a little bit of a presentation there of. Um, our model here, Jim, and uh, where do you see the connections? And then we'll turn it over to uh, the questions from the audience. Um, where do you see the connections between um, the, the model that you've worked at in, in ELA, math, science, um, and what we're working on in social studies? Well, I think, um, I think it's all very applicable. I mean, I think the reason that um, foundations and folks have invested in, in the literacy, math, and science is just because we have uh, right now more agreement around from a standards viewpoint of what kids need to know and be able to do. So then we can use those standards to then create instructional materials. And like Chalani was saying, make them open source and available so that everybody has access to them. And then really focus on what is the support that teachers need to teach them. Um, I think now is a, a, a really important time for our country to sort of get uh, as concrete as possible about the same with social studies and with civics. And so what is it that all kids need to know and be able to do? Um, and, and, and that whether that happens as a whole country or whether that happens uh, regionally or in, within states, 
uh, it's still a very important conversation to have. But I think everything that we're talking about um, is still very applicable. Uh, it's just defining what, being clear about what is high quality. Well, part of high quality is it's aligned to standards, but it's also then how is it designed to support teaching and learning? Um, so it's not just giving the teachers uh, materials with the what, but like we said before, how you how the materials support the how as well. Um, and I think when we put out standards and we put out frameworks and we put out instructional designs and, and that's it, we're still leaving a lot of work for the teacher to pull all those things together to figure out what am I going to do in the class next week with my kids. And there's still a whole lot of work to do when you give them more um, more in a set of instructional materials, but then their focus is really on planning for instruction and really then focusing on what I need to do to adapt these to meet the needs of my kids, as opposed to, you know, going online with Google and Pinterest and going, where, where can I find an activity to teach X, Y, or Z? Um, I think teachers deserve to have materials that already provide that so that they can focus on teaching. Arne, if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump in on Jennifer's um, comment here. Uh, on the in the Q and A, we, um, she, I think she's hitting on a really important tension here, and I think Jim, you were hitting on this as well, and just talking about like where we are in social studies, and you know, a lot of districts haven't adopted curriculum in a long time, and they're really thinking about how do they go about doing this. And, but there's this tension because if you're teachers who are involved, you want to involve, you know, teacher voice in the in the uh, instructional materials adoption is an important piece of it, but if they don't know what inquiry looks like, that can be really challenging, right? Because they're not understanding the, the pieces that the components they're really looking for. And so she's saying like, hey, where do I go to find this PD? And I got to tell you, Jennifer, we are thinking a lot about it and really trying to see can we think about some professional learning that goes with our curriculum review guide specifically on each of the category, on each of the domains? Um, because I, I hear you. I think that's a real challenge that we need to acknowledge that if you're asking teachers to come in and make, help make these decisions, which we want them to be a part of, how is the district leader, and Martin was hitting on this again, that district and instructional lead and uh, school administrator, there's such an important cog deciding that we have instructional time, making the priority choice that they're going to adopt materials, deciding that we're going to give professional learning time, putting all the resources that are needed into this, they also have to have their teachers on board of what they're looking for. And so there needs to be some professional learning even before you move to a curriculum-based professional learning model. So Jennifer, I'm, it's not to you know skirt your question, it's to say we're thinking a lot about it and I agree completely that that's a real need. Well, just to build a, a put a footnote or add a little bit to what Shadi's saying, I think sometimes if we can find like a prototype unit or something that exhibits like this is what we're talking about. It's not a full course. It's not everything a teacher needs to teach a grade, but it's a it's an it's a prototype. It's an example. And then you could apply these principles of then supporting the, the have teachers learn to use that particular unit with curriculum based professional learning, um, because it, it could help sort of at least introduce to some of the shifts that you may be talking about, some different ways of teaching. Maybe I'm not used to project-based teaching or doing a more inquiry-based uh, learning approach. But if, there, if I had a, a unit that I might just replace something that I'm currently doing, then it, would, it wouldn't be as high stakes. It wouldn't put you in that panic zone that you're talking about, yep. but it would give you a chance to kind of learn something. Um, so I think the key is to find those exemplars and then maybe say, hey, let's try that and let's do it as a group of teachers together um, and, and, and hope that we get some, uh, some support and time together to learn how to use it and then reflect on how it went. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we're unfortunately we're out of time. I feel like that there are questions that need to be still answered. But uh, I'm I am going to share the information with um, with all of our attendees that you share, Jim, because I feel like specifically we had uh, some chatter about those three documents for instructional coaches, for teachers, for leaders uh, that I think people were really excited about, and they're going to they're going to be able to put in. Um, uh, uh, they're going to be able to put into practice. And then I will follow up with other people who are asking, asking questions. Brenda just asked a question. I wonder, Shanti, if you can take care of that. Um, but, uh, but Jim, what's real quick, what's the future of this project? Is this, are, are you continuing to, to develop uh, ideas, materials, trainings uh, around curriculum-based professional learning? Well, I think the biggest uh, thing that we're, we're focused on is when we put the report together uh, and, and built off the work our grantees were doing and with their district partners, 
Um, the stories that are in the report all focus on a particular element. And that was sort of to highlight like, well, so what does this element look like in practice? But in reality, if you go back to the metaphor of the periodic table, the elements come together in combinations. And so I think what we need people to see more through the work in the field is how elements in all of those categories have to be combined in order to create really powerful professional learning experiences for teachers. And, um, and so we're getting a lot of interest in the report and people read it and go, oh, this is great. We think the same thing and so may even say, oh, and we're doing it. And then you talk to them a little more and you realize like, wait a minute, are, are you really doing it? And so I think we still have some, some reflection to do about what does it look like when you pull from these different groups of elements and then combine them in to powerful professional learning experiences for teachers. I think it's a start. It was a, it's a way to provide some common language to talk about curriculum-based professional learning. But I think we still have a lot to learn of like, what does it take to really put these elements together and, and create the support teachers need? Well, Jim, we'll have to have you maybe back uh, next spring to see what what you've what how this uh, model has evolved. Um, Great, sounds wonderful. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share today. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, Jim. And Shanti, thanks for stopping in as well. All right, everyone, take care, and uh, you'll hear from me in a couple of days.